What I like to advise people is think about passive investments in three different pillars. The three pillars are, I call it execution, which is the GP's ability to execute on something, right? which depends on many things, including their track record, for example, and just integrity. The, the second thing is alignment of interests. In other words, you can have a GP who is exceptional executing, but your alignment is just not there. And then uh, the third thing is the actual property itself. And in, in a weird way, I actually advise people to look at them in that order. So execution first, alignment of interest second, and third is the property, which is kind of what you're actually investing in. <laughs> Listen, everybody, we all know that real estate is the most proven way to build wealth. But why isn't everyone wealthy from real estate then? It's hard to know where to start, and most of the education out there is just complete trash, and you end up investing your money on a series of courses instead of in real estate. That's not how this podcast works. We give you the blueprint to successful real estate investing and bring on guests actually willing to share their secrets. I started my real estate investing journey as a freshman in college when I bought my first duplex and have been in the trenches doing deals ever since. And today, I now own hundreds of millions of dollars of investment property. On this podcast, you will learn what you actually need to know to be a successful active or passive real estate investor. And we'll offer our takes on what's happening today so you can navigate this market and build wealth. I'm Drew Brenneman, and this is the Brenneman Blueprint. All right, we have Alexier on the podcast today. So he's got a, uh, a tricky last name to pronounce. So we, <laughs> I, w- I went with the recommendation, just maybe uh, maybe skip trying to pronounce it. But so um, Alexier, he has a uh, he's been in real estate for quite a while. I've known him for a few years now, and he's he started a community recently and a whole business around advising passive investors on what to look for with sponsors and in different deals. So I uh, want to wanna welcome you to the podcast. Welcome. Thanks, Drew. It's, a, it's such a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So I think I, it'd be probably best to start with kind of what's your background in real estate and kind of how, how'd you get to where you're at today? Uh, I've done all types of investing and ultimately spent close to five years at a public REIT uh, called Store Capital, which is now private. And coming out of that experience, I learned a lot about how to look at risk. Um, I, I led the investment team that underwrote dozens of deals every single day and, and pushed out a few billion. So, you know, it was just unprecedented amount of deal flow and, and ability to look at tricky parts of transactions and, and understand whether it's something that you should pass on or, or invest in. I left about 18 months ago to go out on my own, um, and ultimately that led me to this journey. Um, it started uh, pretty recently. Uh, I think I'm on week 12, I want to say. So it's fairly new. Um, the The way that it really started is pretty simple. Like I, I got a bunch of decks from people um, asking me to review them, uh, mostly friends. And... I started noticing a pattern where you have extremely sophisticated people in other fields, doctors, attorneys, software engineers, making what I would say pretty um, irresponsible investments without even knowing you know, what a cap rate is or some, some basic terms without understanding what is normal for fees or structures. And uh, at some point, it just dawned on me that this <laughs> the, it's an extremely opaque marketplace between the GPs and LPs, um, and uh, perhaps some someone needs to do something about it. And I decided to give it a chance. Yeah, that's what were some of the common things you were seeing then as you reviewed these decks. So in the beginning, what prompted me to start, which I you know, funny enough, I keep hearing, is you know, comments like multifamily is a great investment because I can never lose my money since everyone needs a place to live. Right. Um, which, you know, I understand obviously where that assumption comes from, but it's extremely, extremely wrong. And then you hear things like, uh, how could I ever lose money in real estate? I looked at a deal for a friend, um, about a month before I decided to start this. And he just said, I don't understand. Can you, can you explain to me how I could ever lose money? If I'm investing money into a building, you can always sell it, can't you? Which again, you, you kind of you kind of understand where that comes from. There is collateral, right? Um, but obviously, uh, anyone in the real estate world that's honest. <laughs> um, yeah, they can go down in value. That's how you would lose money. Of course, of course. Um, yeah. and, I, and I think, uh, look, uh, 
we've had like an incredible rise um, in prices and appreciation between, you know, uh, single family homes, which is what people kind of base their more more general real estate assumptions on. And, and you know, I think for some reason, uh, too many people assume that prices can only go up, rents can only go up. And uh, I think a big reason why is they forget what happened before a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think, and I've, I've noticed that too, where you have people that are, you know, they're very, they're very smart. I mean, they figured out how to be an engineer or a doctor or what have you. Um, but then they never, you know, they haven't spent much time learning about different investment products or, you know, or if they're going to invest in a real estate deal, kind of what are the mechanics? How does this work? What are the important things to look out for? And then they either, yeah. um, you know, they're making a lot of investments just based on recommendations other people are giving them or that their friend invested in it. Uh, so I'm, so that's yeah. the kind of stuff you were running, running up against. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and I, and I still do, you know, obviously now is, uh, it's my full-time job and I'm very active in it, but, um, I think education is, uh, it's very difficult to find in this space, um, it, it's actually, I, I don't know if there's another space like this where there's so much capital going into it every single year. I, I've yet to get my hands on a, um, you know, some official research study, but uh, it's got to be billions, uh, even if you exclude um, sort of the institutional asset allocators. There's a ton of money that goes into it. Everyone from putting in, in some cases, $5,000, which I have an opinion on, but in most cases, let's say 50 k and up. All, you know, all the way to people putting in a million dollars and then calling me when they get a capital call email saying, hey, I got, you know, I put in a million dollars into this deal six months ago and I got this email saying capital call, like, uh, what should I do? You know, and obviously you'll, you'll, you you dig in and you look at the asset and you realize somehow you have to tell this person that his million dollars is gone. Not not 100% gone, right? But like uh, in probability gone, right? Uh unless you actually lose the asset to the lender but um and, and then they have to make uh, a decision of you know do you want to put um so to speak good money after bad um or uh put it somewhere else and those are very difficult uh very difficult decisions yeah they they definitely are so then what are you if someone were just to say let's start from some from, from scratch here like i'm i'm new to looking at investing in real estate, I want to do it with a sponsor, like I just want to do it, you know, passively. I mean, what would you recommend? Like, what's the first step this person should do? Um, so I think the, the first step is really understanding. You kind of made an assumption there. And I'll, I'll actually, I'm very independent to this whole thing, unlike others. So I, I, I want to always take people back and say, just because you want to invest in something, it doesn't have to be that you invest in real estate, right? So that that's a much broader question that I think we could talk about for a while. But I think to me, the first question is, should you be investing actively into anything, right? Because it takes time to vet any type of investment, um, even if it's a passive investment into a syndication. But as as, uh, as your sort of net worth grows and your risk appetite goes up, in a sense, um, you, you're able to start putting money into things to uh, to try to grow your wealth. Um, of course, once you decide, now this is kind of going into your question already, once you decide that you want to invest in real estate, um, I think the, the best thing to do first is just get educated. I think people tend to um, get educated in two different ways. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, I'm personally like a very hands-on person. Um, so I prefer looking at actual deals, getting in front of sponsors, um, and trying my kind of like trying my hand at, at this thing and asking questions and see how it works. I think the risk there is that if you're a total novice, you might, you know, annoy some GPs um, with questions that you should probably already know. So the, the other side of that is just uh, educating yourself. You know, there's some books out there. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I would be crazy not to shout out my blog, you know, like I've been writing pretty consistently um on all types of lessons that yeah um, what's your blog like why don't you share the how do people find it yeah it's um it's lp uh, stands for limited partner uh lessons at dot substack dot com lp lessons dot substack dot com and uh you know i i share a post there 
that goes in depth on a given topic once a week. And then I also share essentially a digest of any of my thoughts throughout the week, right? So I'll, I'll be advising someone on a deal, whether it's in distress, an existing position or a new position they're thinking about taking on. Um, and I try to pick out um, lessons that are applicable to a broader audience uh, without identifying the GP or the LP or anything like that, obviously, um, that could be useful to someone. And, you know, on, on Fridays, I send out the the digest of those ideas. That's great. And then, and you get the digest, you get the email, as long as you, you sign up somewhere on the subs on the, on the webpage for that. Yeah. Yeah. You just sign up, uh, the, the, the digest is free. Uh, my deep dives, uh, are 10, $10 a month, which, you know, from from what I heard so far, they tend to provide a lot more value to people than ten dollars a month. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it's lplessons.substack.com. Great, and then I think in the the books they were thinking that come to mind that would be worth reading for people looking to get into this. What would they be? I'm hesitant to recommend them uh, because I haven't read them in full yet. I started reading one that was recommended by a lot of people, and I found a mistake. So, okay, nice. um, so I think. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not. I'll give one, one of them. I found a mistake on another one that's pretty famous is written by a GP, which I have thoughts around again. You know, I, I think when you're advising people to how to how to invest their money and you sort of have an inherent bias by being a GP, um, on the one hand, you have a lot of experience and you can speak to the topics, which is great. But on the other hand, I think there's an inherent bias in the book um, to invest in real estate as opposed to anything else. Uh, which I which I disagree with, even though I'm in the field. I, I just think that's not a it's not an independent opinion, you know? Yeah. I mean, right. Right. If you want just let's say cash flow, I mean, there's other things that have that, you know, like there's, uh, you know, plenty of people that invest in real estate. They also invest in oil and gas or ATMs or there's other stuff out there. <laughs> you know, they're all they all have their merits, their risks, their pros or cons. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Let's say uh, I guess since this this is a real estate podcast, at least let's just maybe jump into what you would look for. Let's say they've made the decision. I, I do real estate does make sense for me. Uh, then what's, what's the next step after, after that? Like you, you should start, look, you know, I think you said you like to get in front of sponsors. Uh, so then you, you like to maybe vet the, the sponsors first before looking at deals or what's, what's maybe, I think I already asked what's step one. So then what's, what's step two then at this point? Yeah, so, um, and, and if anyone who is deeply interested in this can look on, uh, you know, my Substack. I What I like to advise people is think about passive investments in three different pillars. And, and I can go through them uh, a little bit here, but again, in, in, in much more depth, they're described in, in the Substack. So um, the first, uh, I guess, as, a, as an introduction first, uh, the, the three pillars are um, the... I call it execution, which is the GP's ability to execute on something, right? Which depends on many things, um, including their track record, for example, and just integrity. The The second thing is alignment of interests. In other words, you can have a GP who is exceptional executing, but your alignment is just not there. That's a whole discussion around fees and co-invests uh, and a lot of those things, which are, in my opinion, talk, not talked about enough. Um, and then uh, the third thing is the actual property itself. And in, in a weird way, I actually advise people to look at them in that order. Um, so execution first, uh, alignment of interest second, and third is the property, which is kind of what you're actually investing in, <laughs> right? Yeah. But I think people tend to forget that when you're investing as an LP, you are passive and silent. And if something goes wrong, you have, I mean, 95% of the time you have no say maybe 99%. And, and so therefore, um, it's very important to do the first two things before even looking at the property itself. And I also like to look at the variables as independent variables. They, they should all be connected at the end when you are making the investment decision because a strength in one of the three can offset a weakness in another. But, but it's really important to view them independently because you could have, you know, for example, you can have a sponsor that, you know, it's their first deal, for example. So, you know, the, the track record isn't necessarily there and you're not sure if they're going to be able to execute. 
But the second pillar, which is alignment of interests, is phenomenal. You know, they're co-investing a lot of money and the waterfall is really you know, PGP aligned well, right? And then you look at the property and it's it's a really great opportunity that they found, right? So because of that, um, you can sort of have iterations across these three variables that um, offset one another. And uh, a weakness in one is never reason to pass on something. Uh, it's it's more of just like a reminder to be like okay let me let me check the others and see if it balances out you know yeah that makes a lot of sense I mean a common saying you know is um and I'm sure I've heard this just a million times is you're betting on the the you know the jockey more than the horse on a lot of these where you know I heard on another podcast somebody was asking uh, like a pretty big investor uh, that invests only as JV equity you know so LP uh, type checks and was like would you rather bet on uh, bad property with a good sponsor, you know, this is if you had to pick or, you know, a, a bad sponsor with a good property and, you know, believe it or not, they, yeah, you picked the bad property with the good sponsor. Cause it's like at the least, yes. uh, you got somebody who knows how to do it and isn't going to, you know, mess up a good thing. They're going to improve a bad thing. So, um, yes, made sense. Yeah. I, yeah. I, and I, I mean, I, I like just to, to add a little bit, like I, there, there is a very, um, there's a lot of intent in putting property third. Which which is be kind of behind your comment. I don't know who it was, but I guess, you know, if you're listening, high five. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I tend to agree with it, but you, you will find uh, people that do extremely well in two buckets and not so well in one, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, like, um, no, I think people um, people just need to understand that investments are inherently risky, regardless of how they score in all the categories. Um and everything is relative. That's the hardest part, I think, to internalize in this world of like, you know, passive investing. Yeah, yeah. I think it would be worth, I think let's maybe circle back on each of the pillars. So then you you like to you like to go through them in that order. So the first thing is execution. So let's say, you know, you meet a sponsor, they have a, a deal, let's say they ask you want to, um, you want to invest, like the first thing you're going to do, you're not looking, let's talk about you more than the deal for a second here. And then what are, what are you advising people look for on this execution pillar? So you're asking what types of questions, what are you looking for? Yeah. So I, I typically advise people to ask less and read more, you know, uh, it, it just, um, I, I think people tend to be biased by how someone speaks or, you know, what they wear or whatever. And, um, I think it's always much better to look at the facts and then, you know, Certainly, it, it's always nice when someone is nice and presentable and whatever. Um, I just don't think it should be a reason to invest in someone, which, you know, you'd be surprised how many times it is. Um, so, or maybe you wouldn't be surprised. I don't yeah, know. maybe I need to. Yeah, I maybe I need to get a better car then. I have. A, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, they, but then, just to back up, what are they reading? Just to be clear, like you want to. You're gonna read their website, assess their capability, read the deal that they're talking about, but don't yeah, read so, about. Yeah, so I think once you meet a GP, let them send you a deal. Uh, in the deal, I think the, the most important thing is: Do I think uh, this team can execute on this deal? Right. So historic performance doesn't necessarily need, you know mean anything about the future, right? But that's where track record comes in. Look at the track record slide, like quite literally go there, skip to that slide and, and see what it says. I, I think it might surprise you when I say this, but I think 60% of decks that I get don't have one. Don't and in some what? cases, a track record, don't have a track record slide. Oh. Um, so it's actually so in, our first page after the disclaimer, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and so I think uh, that's actually good. And, and I think what I always recommend, sometimes I review GP decks um, and, and provide them feedback. And what I always tell them is like, if if you have a good track record and a good team, that should be like one of your first slides, like certainly number three, if not number two. And I often find that it's actually like buried all the way at the end, sometimes in the appendix. And I'm like, this is some, this is way more important than the property that you're selling and the investment. Like it's the team and the experience, right? Anyway, so going back to your question, um, track record is really important, right? Um, th the second thing is, uh, which are of course related, like, Who's running the investment? Who's actually making the decisions? Uh, oftentimes I see teams that are confusing, I guess is the best way to say it. You know, like you have several people in a deal, 
It's not clear, like, who's going to make decisions if things go south. Nothing wrong with that. Like, a deal is a good deal. Great. But, like, but I, I think just LP should be aware that, like, I should ask this question. Like, you know, if, if it's clear that there's one person making the decisions, that person has the background and the experience, and then there's a team, that's good. If if it's if it's not clear who's going to be making decisions or what the relationship is with between the different principles involved, um, then I think you should ask <laughs> because yeah. I've seen, you know, I've seen things go south in those cases. Yeah, I'm I'm sure you have because I see that and it's uh I, I know what you mean where it's confusing and I, I think it is a bad thing where I look at some of these decks and there's, you know, it's a combination of three, four different companies essentially to get a deal closed. And it doesn't say what role each company is even providing. It just, it just says like this company is doing one thing and there's another company attached to it. There's another, it doesn't mm -hmm. say who's the decision maker. Uh, it doesn't say who's doing yeah. what you can, could try to piece that together, but you don't, you know, if they all have an equal vote, and it's four different companies. Like, yeah, and, and I'll tell you, decided, usually, right? just from a legal perspective, usually they don't. Usually it's like one or two people find the deal, but they don't have the money, so they find a co-GP. The co-GP sort of like utilizes their name. Sometimes it's not like a very valuable name, in my opinion, from what I've seen. <laughs> but they, mm -hmm. they still sell that GP on sort of using their name and network to... At them, at themselves as a co GP in return for obviously a nice chunk of the promote. I talk about this sometimes too. Like when L an LP looks at that, I think one thing that should come to mind is why is that co GP getting better economics than me when all they're doing is providing capital? Um, hopefully, the answer is because they know each other and they have done plenty of deals together, right? Um, or at least the answer is they have a ton of experience in the space, not just raising money, right? Which you find often, but actual on the ground experience. Um, and I, I think what you find often is uh, they actually don't. Yeah, I, I, it seems like a lot of the these these deals where they have you know once you get over two co GPs, it's almost like I don't you don't need more. Like what are you all these people doing? And you know you dig into it, and it's really they're just they're just raising capital. I mean that's what it is. Yeah. You know, if yeah, you got exactly. a twenty million dollar deal and each person is only able to raise a million or so, I mean, you end up with some of these, you know, deals that are set up, and you look at that, and you're like, "Wow, that's pretty wild." Wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. What's the most? What's the highest number you've uh, you've seen? I'd be curious. That might be a, a funny thing um, to know for co GPs on one deal. I think I've seen five. Like, just to be clear, I'm not talking about five principals working for the same company, right? Uh, that would be fine as long as like you know there's a clear decision maker out of the five um but i'm talking about like five completely separate people yeah in many cases never have never done deals together uh all you know plastered over a deck <laughs> yeah i heard somebody tell me 21 i don't have that deck but he uh yeah i mean if you're in some of these masterminds or whatever i guess that's what's going on mentorship groups or whatever but yeah that's yeah because he he was in it i was like how many how many other code gps are there and and that you know that gets into a whole thing with securities laws and all sorts of stuff and so i think um you know i always tried i haven't really done uh done a lot of that because yeah it's been uh um you know we we source the deals we do the deals we raise the money you know so we haven't haven't yeah. gone that route i maybe i've stuck to smaller deals than i could have if i would have been like all right i'll take on all these money raising partners and do that um but that sort of seemed like the better better path at least for me thus far but um you know it's, it's working for them but yeah so then okay so you would prefer to read the materials and not be influenced by like them being a smooth talker or the Rolex sparkling at you or whatever, you know, it's, um, really just read the, yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> read the materials and disassess if they can, if they can execute on this deal. Um, and that it makes sense who's doing what, um, then what do you look for with the alignment of interest pillar? Yeah. So simply said, I think you can kind of divide it into two parts. Um, one is just, um, how much are they co-investing? Right. Um, and I think that's probably the most important. Um, the, I think that's a topic that's not discussed enough. And, and I would also tell you that probably 60 to 70% of decks that I get don't even have a clear co-invest, 
like described in the deck, which kind of surprises me. Uh, it, and it's sometimes it's not because they don't they're not planning to co-invest. They just don't put it in. Uh, it, meaning it's not it's not abundantly clear, and I think it should be. This episode is brought to you by Brenneman Capital, the firm I started to help others invest in real estate. We invest in multifamily assets that meet our very strict criteria in locations positioned for the most growth. We use institutional quality investment models and processes and combine that with old school hustle to generate superior risk adjusted returns for our investors. Invest now or learn more at Brenneman.com. Um, and what what do you want to see? Like, because to you, you want to, that's the most important. But then do you look at, at it as just uh, dollars relative to the deal, relative to the person? Or how, how do you look at it? Well, so I, I, I think you can obviously make it as complicated as you want, right, in terms of net worth and whatever. But but I think simply put, uh, you like to see, I, I think, at least 5% of equity being put up by... Um, by, by the GP, um, and of course, higher is greater. I, I recommend people to see like seven and a half to ten or something like that. But uh, you know, again, if if I see five, like that's not a red flag. It's just like a little bit low, but like it's substantial. And then you can and then you can kind of like start looking at well, is it substantial to their net worth? Where did it come from? Is a whole other question, right? Like sometimes I see six percent acquisition fees um, and no co invest. Really? Yeah. Yeah, so like, um, and but key, let's keep in mind that this is something that like uh, many people don't understand is the, the acquisition fee obviously is based on the entire transaction, right? But the co invest is a percentage of equity, right? <laughs> so um, it, it's it's almost crazy not to invest something out of out of the acquisition fee, right? Um, and kind of like, uh, of, of course, too. They need to pay payroll and et cetera, et cetera, right? But like, I often see um, in many circumstances, uh, people are ripping off, you know, like massive acquisition fees without co-investing. Uh, and it, and again, um, it's really case by case because like sometimes a deal is so good, right? And the GP is so good and so experienced. That you're like, I don't really care if you co-invest or she, you know, like they're just so good and they've done this for 50 years or 10 years or 12 years, I don't know, whatever. Um, and I don't I don't really care as much about the alignment of interests. Um, I, I could go, you know, what what's his, you know, hundred thousand dollars? It doesn't mean anything to me. Like the guy's worth twenty million dollars, or I don't know, you know what I mean? Um, so it's all relative, but I think it's important to look at the uh the, the whole picture. Yeah. And so, but yeah, that all makes sense. And they do dig into where the money comes from. Like if I said 5% of the money is we're putting in 5% of the money in this deal, Alexei, what are, what's the, do you, what do you ask me next? Anything you're, oh, you're reading it. Let's say there's no more info. Are you, you're asking, you're going to dig in further? Or yeah. Just... So, um, look, the best, the best thing ever is if it's in the deck, right? If you have to ask, then, um, there's at least a possibility that the GP was planning to get away with not putting anything in. I don't think that's the majority of the cases, but it's certainly, you know, a substantial sum. I think the next question is not to the GP, but to yourself. In other words, knowing about the GP and knowing what that 5% is dollar wise, do you believe that that dollar amount is coming from the person? You know, just, just by reading the room in other, in other words, I'm not saying, you know, like get his, get his or her like personal financial statements. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just, their second deal. And it says they're putting in a million dollars. Like you don't need to ask them where it's yeah. coming from probably, you know, unless they have a yeah, yeah. And, trust and fund like, or um, exactly. Or, or like maybe it's the first deal and like they need a million dollars. So like in, in some, in, in a case like that, you, you essentially know that it's, I mean, nine times out of 10, not theirs, which again is okay. But then you have to ask like, so where is that money coming from? And are they getting better economics than me? And am I okay with that? If, if if the answer is they're getting better economics because they're extremely experienced in the space and they're going to help on the ground and strategy, fine. Like, that's great. That's a, that's a real co-invest where someone is putting their money in and they're aligned with you. If it's, you know, um, 
a relative or whatever who has nothing to do with the investment and no experience, then their money, so to speak, is just as green as yours. But they're getting all these economics. And I would argue that's not it it's kind of a co invest, but kind of not. You know, meaning there's like the the family shame, <laughs> yeah, so to speak, of like losing family money. Um but but you really but but that uncle or whatever is not doing the actual work, right? So like the 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 co invest isn't as uh as strong. I don't know how else to describe it. It's just I know a, what you're weaker, saying. Yeah. yeah, I know what you're saying. Where if they're getting a better deal, uh, you know, to invest in the GP side, you know, how how in how strongly do they believe in the deal as you're looking at it? You know, is another way to say that. And then you know, two. I mean, you got you're you're just basically saying in factor and everything. If they said the money's coming from, you know, my mom, like that's a different deal. You're going to see your mom a lot. There's a lot of pressure on you. You know, it's uh. I mean, to be honest, I probably treat my 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 parents' money would be better than my own money. You know, where like some people would, um, uh, you know, because you got to deal with any of the, you know, complaining and you see them every holiday and every, you know, all the time. Um, so you know, that's uh, so yeah, you're you're saying just look at it in totality and kind of uh, really pause yeah. and think about it. Because I guess yeah, that's what I was saying. Because what I'm saying, what's the next question? Like yeah, if I see someone's putting in five percent, I mean, I'd always ask how, how much are you putting in. Like as you, you as like Drew, what are you putting in? Because if, you know, a lot of companies, yeah. they might say um, you're putting in 5%, but they have, might have a partner. And on this one, their partner's putting in more, or they actually raise that 5% now as the deals get bigger from their, their friends and family. And then more from the whole, you know, the whole LP universe, they raise the, the LP side and then the, um, the GP gets split up on their, you know, some of their first folks or something, you know, like I've, I've seen yeah. that. So I think it's a good question to try to see if you can find out how much the person's actually put, putting in and then what, uh, and yeah, and who else that's like close to them is investing. That's what I try to find out. Like if you're having your pushing your like yeah. parents to put in more money, like that's, this sounds like a good deal, you know? Um, but not everyone's parents. Yeah, can invest, so um, that's not the, the end all be all either. Yeah, and and I, I I just think it's important to understand the back and forth, and and I think it's important for LPs to have that back and forth in their mind. Like like you said, in in some sense, the the mother co investment is you know one could argue it's like sort of more scary, or, or perhaps more even more intense than the guy putting up his own money. And I think there's a counter argument as well because the mom is not helping, and like if interest rates rise, how much they rise, the mom will look at the son and be like, you know, son. Like, this wasn't your fault. Like, just move on to something else. And and in in those circumstances, like you, you wonder um, if there was a co invest from someone that really knew what they were doing, would they have gotten themselves into the same position, right? Um, so so I think there's two sides. Um, now on on your second point, specific comment of asking like how much are you putting up yourself? I find that, and I don't know, maybe I'm. I try to be very sensitive to GPs. I, you know, I think it's a very hard job to find something and put something under contract um, that is actually good, you know, uh, and then syndicating itself is like, it's, it's a full-time job, right? Answering all the questions and whatever. So I always guide LPs to try to answer as much as you can yourself, right? Uh, before asking every single question, right? And, and I think that's just good life advice, I think, in general. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so because of that, uh, I guess going back to your point of how much are you putting up yourself, um, personally, you know, before asking that, I, I think it's like a little bit of a personal question. It shouldn't be, but it can be, you know, especially if someone is sort of like new and maybe sensitive to something like that. Um, you should at least know why you're asking it, right? Like, which is why, again, I kind of take people back to the deck and like, you know, is this a person that has been in the industry for a long time and they clearly have a million dollars to invest? In which case you can ask the question, but maybe it's not as important, you know? But in, in the cases of, um, you know, someone that, that's um, that's much newer uh, to, to the industry, then, then for sure, I think at some point you have to ask. People ask me all the time and I don't think it's a personal question. Like it's my deal, yeah. I'm... 
pushing it out, you'll see it, uh, you know, potentially if depending on if the, you know, if all the percentages are shown or not, but you'll, you know, people, I, th- I think it's worth knowing, you know, um, shows your conviction to the deal, but it's not like you also as a sponsor, you can't invest all your money in the deal. You also have to put up earnest money for this deal. The next one, pay for your employees buying the deal. Uh, the, you know, just, uh, there's a lot of places your money goes and just being able to throw it into the property. So you got to actually run the company. And then if you just, and also it's, it's hard with like, if you invest more than your acquisition fee on every deal, like eventually you run out of money unless you're also then selling deals to then produce profits, you yeah. know? So then it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to navigate definitely as a, as a sponsor. Yeah, all and, that. I, and I so. think, uh, that's not being talked enough about as uh, just the, 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 point that you mentioned now is important um i think lps don't realize how difficult it is to run a successful gp and and by successful i don't mean you know billions of dollars but like making ends meet and not being concerned about the next payroll you know what i'm saying um it's it's a pretty complicated business and i think a lot of lps are pretty blind to the fact that like the acquisition fee is really important um, because of the, you know, three earnest money deposits someone lost in order to get to this deal. Now, there's also another side, right? Which is sometimes you have sponsors that aren't willing to give up the earnest money and still get into a deal. Yeah, you can tread carefully against those folks just by, you know, really, you know, what I think is an important thing to kind of find out, um, and it hasn't really come up yet, but when you're talking to the sponsor and find out what they're like, like, see how you can assess what's like the most important to them. Cause you know, a lot of people, their number one priority is, you know, scaling a business or, um, closing big deals. And, you know, none, none of those to me as a LP or even for my business, I don't think those are important actually in terms of as like on the list of priorities, my priorities are doing good deals because if, I think if you do good deals, then they have a good investors have a good experience then they'll invest more just cause I could, yeah, I could push a deal through, save my earnest money. Uh, but then guess what? It's a bad experience. And then you're, lo- you're underperforming for your investors. And then they're hesitant on the next one. You're hurting yep. your track record. So I don't, I think that you want to hear someone who talks more like that. And cause the number one thing I care about is my track record. Like I'm killing deals all the time. We're not doing stuff where we could just push a little here, push a little there and uh, ignore something and do the deal. But I know like in two years, then when we own this and we're running into problems, we just shot ourselves in the foot. Even if you just want to be selfish and say, what's best for you? I don't think pushing those deals is uh, focusing on just getting big to get big is actually even in anyone's best interest. Um, So, I mean, I would try to, you know, if as I'm an LP, I'm trying to find out like, what are they interested in? Cause people who like doing the work and putting up good returns and um, like have that long-term mindset. Cause I, there's, you know, you know, this comes up with like brokers and stuff too, where like a lot of times people will send me deals that I don't need to sign anything. They know that they'll get paid uh, by me because I want the deal after this one. So yeah, you'll get paid on this one. Cause I want to get the next ones. I'm not going to screw you over to save 1% or whatever on this deal because i don't i'd actually just rather even if we're just thinking what's best for me like i want to get the future deals too and i want everything to go well because there's more for everybody then so like that's um you know i think important when you're assessing the 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 jockey so to speak because yeah they could have the best deal ever but if it's just going to be uh you know turned into a stepping stone to scale the business you know they might sell it too early or be it to death so they can you know get bigger so yep makes yeah makes a lot of sense um i think then maybe just to close out then what do you look for with the pro with the property then so let's say those first two pillars are good what uh what do you look for in a property sure uh, i think it's important uh again so, something that isn't talked about enough is the type of strategy that the lp goes after right um i think many times i'll hear from lps that invested in a development let's say and they're upset that there's no cash flow a year later and i'm like well what what, I, what were you thinking like you don't just put up a building overnight and start cash flowing <laughs> you know like yeah um but we have but, a blog about uh, this i i know where you're going this is important yeah 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 I, I think it's really important because i i think part of that blame goes to the gps unfairly you know because it's like it's like well, like 
you can't expect something to cash flow when I'm still building it, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but but I think the opposite is also true. I see a lot of GP decks that are either in development or have a value adds that don't really do a good job of explaining to LPs in simple English that this is not a immediate cash flow opportunity, you know. Um, so I think there is something to be probably improved on both sides in, in terms of uh, communication or education, right? Um, now, in terms of once you get to the actual investment, um, look, uh, I am I buying something at a good price, right? Uh, I, I think that is, in some sense, pretty simple, but it's actually pretty complex. Um, and again, just from the decks that I see, it's very often the case that uh, the comps that are provided um, are either pretty clearly like selectively chosen or they're just not complete one or the other you know uh or, or they're not explained right um in so in many cases i'll just see statements like you know we are getting the best property ever or something like that <laughs> without any support whatsoever um you know so uh, there's that and then there's just the, the the way that i sort of like to uh, separate that last pillar is there's like the valuation. In other words, am I, am I, am I getting into this investment at the right price, regardless of what it is? Right. Um, and then the second part is the business plan. Like what, what are they planning to do? Do I believe, presumably you believe their ability to execute on it, right. Based on their track record, but does the business plan actually make sense? Like if you look at the numbers, um, is it viable? Does the model make sense? Uh, what could go wrong, right? Like th th questions like that, I think are really important to ask. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think, yeah, one thing that's often overlooked uh, from what I've saw is, yeah, matching up your your personal investment goals with with an in, with that investment. To your point on the cash flow investor doing a development deal, that's, that's the wrong investment for them. Development deals are for high risk, high return people who don't need cash flow. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, just simply, so yeah, you need to match that up. And then, you know, the other thing too, is I think what I like to then do is also really just kind of compare the risk of the deal with the other deals I've saw and like, what were the returns for those? And if it makes sense. And I think when, uh, you know, oftentimes like you'll see people get into a much more risky deal for a couple percent more of projected return. And I'm always telling people, I don't think it's worth it. You know, if you could do a development deal and make a, let's just make up numbers, a 17 IRR or uh, projected or buy an existing building and make a 15, I mean, I'm taking the 15 all day because that's much more probable to actually get that and yeah. way less risky. I would need to dig in more on like, what are the assumptions on the, um, the existing course, building? There, there's ways you could yeah. make the existing building more risky than the development deal, depending on how much you lever it up and what kind of debt you do and what your plan is and where you set the rents yeah. and taxes, you know, all the assumptions, but you can, um, I think that's often overlooked because when I go on like a crowd street type place, it's like their biggest deal ever they raised money for was an office building, you know, in Atlanta, you know, like a, the, the, a very risky deal. Um, you know, but it had high projected returns. So, but nice. Yeah. Uh, I think we could probably spend another hour on the topic <laughs> of projected returns <laughs> Yeah, by itself. I think if, if I may just say a sentence, um, I think people always have to keep in mind that you're looking. I'm talking. I'm speaking to LPs. Um, you're you're looking at a sales pitch, and projected returns are part of that sales pitch. Um, so that's not to say that they're wrong. Uh, you could totally be right, but it's only right subject to assumptions that you need to vet. Don't forget. Yeah, and to kind of circle back to the people who care about their track record, then there's another breed of folks who don't want to underperform their numbers because they don't want to deal with the uh you know with the complaining with the questions and then they're not uh they're not pushing their numbers too much you know or you know or, or at all um because i've you know i know folks like that where they are um you know they they want to outperform and then have that as like a feather in their cap or, or leave you know gas in the tank for it to go underperform that's a good point too because especially if someone you know to your to your point before like if you need to the the same person who would just want to get the you know needs to push the deal on to get all their earnest money back i mean okay fine now they're highly motivated like they're not gonna 
cut their assumptions if they notice something else they need to get this they they're just need to get this deal done you know make their fee and get their money back so yeah no it's uh yeah i'm sure you see a lot of a lot of stuff um yeah, maybe I don't know. You got a craziest. Maybe actually, I said we were ending on that. But let's. You got a craziest thing you've saw so far, doing what you're doing. Maybe let's let's actually end with that. Um, most egregious thing maybe you've seen in a deck or. I have to be really careful because uh, you know, like I have confidentiality clauses with everyone. Uh, I think uh, as as vaguely as I can put it is, return of capital is pretty important in a waterfall. And when I say pretty important, it's like uh of critical importance <laughs> um and you know i've seen uh actually more than one case where it was not a part of the waterfall um and i think that is it's a strong statement but it's like it's actually I, in my opinion at least it's pretty close to like legal theft um because well, many times did, lps don't understand what where did the money go for. Yeah, where did the money go then? You're saying the return of ca the capital just gets mixed in with the regular splits? Yeah, yeah. Like you just, uh, you, let's say you have, I don't know, an okay. 8% pref and the LPs get paid 8% and then you just split everything 50-50 even though, I mean, I hope this is obvious, but even though 50-50 was not the capital provided by both parties. Yeah, yeah. that takes the cake. <laughs> okay, I wasn't thinking you are going to say that. <laughs> I was thinking you are going to say, uh, you know, a big acquisition fee or something. Well, yeah, that's... Yeah, that's uh I wonder how that even would work for tax. Yeah, that's a very that's interesting cuz it's not even uh yeah, I see why you mean where it's borderline just taking money cuz it's like the property didn't even generate that. It's just you just had a odd split at the end of their original money put in. Yeah, and and look, th this is uh I mean on a on a separate but separate but uh related topic. I think as as a general rule, I think LP is think too much about the upside of a project and not too much about the downside. Um, I don't think that they should, you know, I don't think they should be pessimistic to the point where they just, you know, say no to everything, but, but at least think about the downside. And so, for example, in, in the example I just gave, um, you know, hypothetically, and again, this is, this is extreme, but I think it's important to like get an LP to sort of wake up and understand what they're signing up for. Let's just say there's no pref. I've actually seen this too. 8% pref and there's no return of capital and a 50-50 split. Okay, so then hypothetically, again, it's extreme, but you buy a building for a million dollars and then the next day the GP, you know, wakes up and is like, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. They sell it and they just pocketed like not exactly 50% of your money, but pretty pretty close. Um and less than 50 because you'd lose money selling it immediately with all the costs yeah but yeah continue. i'm just you know <laughs> ignore the fees and whatever exactly okay. but but i'm just saying um like such a thought exercise is pretty critical um and of course that's extreme because like what gp would just wake up and do that but um you know maybe it's a year from then and the property is still only worth a million dollars so okay same result <laughs> you know um so, um, yeah, I, I just think it's really important to think about downside, especially when you're thinking about the waterfall, uh, how much money is the GP making before you've made your money back? Uh, that is a very simple question that I think a lot of LPs don't know how to answer. And I don't think you should be investing in anything until you can answer that. Yeah, I agree. That's a great, it's a good place to go out on. So then, uh, uh, Alex, how do we get? Uh, how do folks find you again? Maybe I, I know you're on uh, on Twitter and LinkedIn too, so you should get yeah, those um, out as well. Yeah, you know, so. assuming you can spell my last name, <laughs> um, <laughs> you you can find me on Twitter. I like I've started being a little bit more active on LinkedIn as well. And um, for anyone that wants to learn to to invest and kind of learn from these lessons, they can go to lplessons.substack.com. And yeah, you know, like. Uh, I I hope the lessons are helpful. I always like feedback. Um, always like hearing from people. Perfect. Thanks. We'll see ya. All right. Thanks, man.
If you learned something from today's show, leave a review and hit that subscribe button wherever you enjoy your podcast. Dive deeper into real estate investing on Brenneman Capital's website, Brenneman.com, where we have numerous free resources and information that can help both active and passive real estate investors. Accredited investors can get started today as a passive investor in our multifamily investment opportunities by hitting the Invest Now button on our website. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of Drew Brenneman and guests as of the date of recording and do not purport to reflect the views or opinions of Brenneman Capital LLC and its subsidiaries. Views and opinions are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon or deemed as investment or tax advice or an offer to buy or sell securities. The speaker cannot be held responsible for any direct or incidental loss incurred by applying any of the information offered.